Topic Notes 4.3, Measuring Populations and Biodiversity. This picture is actually from a nearshore reef off of Palm Beach County, and it shows a school of smallmouth grunts. And of course, how do we know how many of what is in any particular area? Let's look at how scientists figure it out. So the main idea here is that scientists can measure populations and biodiversity using a variety of techniques. Each method is useful in different situations, but have limitations. And of course, here are your learning goals. Notice there's a lot of apply and that PA down at the bottom actually has to do with a uh, actual lab and performance that we have to do. So first off, measuring biodiversity. Scientists use a range of methods and statistical models to do this. And this includes a number of things, including field work, as you see here in the pictures, uh, and also some mathematical models. One of the first methods we'll look at is the mark recapture release method. This is used for mobile species, essentially those that move around, when it's not practical to count all of them. The accuracy here increases the more sampling you actually do, so above two different site sample sessions. So let's go ahead and look at the process here. Now first you're going to go to a particular site that you're going to study, and then you're going to capture a certain number of individuals and you're going to mark them and release them. Now this is typically done with non-toxic paint or tags or anything that really doesn't have any uh, ill health effects towards the animal. Now, a few days later, you're going to come back and you're going to do another sample session where you're going to collect another group of animals. But this time you're going to look around to see, hmm, are there any of this group of animals that I just collected? Have any of them been previously tagged? The number of marked and unmarked individuals are then counted. And you can see that in the graphic to the right. You have before sampling and then you have those marked with the pink outlines and then they're thrown back in to the water and then a second sample session you're going to come back out and in this case you had five marked and five unmarked fish and thus that gives you a ability to kind of do an equation here that we're going to talk about in a minute to find out what the estimated population size might be. So the Lincoln Index is a mathematical equation that can use the mark, release, recapture data to estimate population size. And it does that by taking a few variables into account. Capital N is the estimate of the population size. Uh, now sub N1 is the number of individuals captured in the first sample. So you get to the site, you capture as many as you do in that first sample session. That's that N sub 1. Now in sub two is the number of individuals, both marked and unmarked, captured in the second session. So that'd be the second time you go to the site, the second time you catch fish, how many total individuals are in there. Now, M sub two is the number of marked individuals recaptured in a second sample. So that's the difference. N sub two is the total number captured in the second sample. M sub two is just the marked individuals captured in that second sample. So then you take it over, you can see it in the equation on the bottom of the screen there on the right, n equals n sub one times n sub two divided by m sub two. Now there are some assumptions and limitations with this method. First of all, marked individuals are unaffected by the tagging process. We're just taking that to, in consideration. Marked individuals disperse evenly throughout the population, meaning that they're not clumped together. Um, they disperse randomly and evenly throughout the uh, population. All animals have the same probability of being marked, meaning that regardless of what individual you are, they could have easily been marked, um, that kind of a thing. All um, The second sample is random, meaning that we randomly sample that second sample. Uh, meaning that we're not trying to target marked fish along the way. And the last thing here is the effects of immigration and immigration, essentially migration in and out of the population, mortality and recruitment are negligible, meaning that they don't play a, a particular role here. Now, you might think that's a lot of sort of limitations, right? Because real world doesn't probably operate like that. And you would be correct into assuming this. This actually works better in more of an isolated system where you don't have a lot of in and outs, so to speak. 
Now, when we want to calculate biodiversity, we have to consider two factors, richness and evenness. Now, richness is the number of species in a community. So how many individual species? In this picture, for example, you have uh, some uh, sharks, you have a species of grunt, you have some a uh, bunch of different species of fish. Now, the evenness would be the measure of the relative abundance of the population. So, like I said, we see, actually, I think there's a few sharks. It's like one, two, three, four, five, or six sharks in there. Um, there's even more of the grunts and the various different fish. So, that's the evenness, the abundance of each of those specific species. A community with many species is considered richer than a community with lower number of species. That makes sense, right? The more species you have, the more rich you are in terms of biodiversity. Now also, a community dominated by one species is considered less diverse than a community in which several species have similar abundances. So this is where you look at the difference between, for example, a coral reef on the left, you have a huge number of species and generally a decent ab abundance for each of those species. Well, over there on the right, you'll see there's like essentially be massive schools of sardines in a near shore area, mostly a sandy little rocky bottom. Um, that's a huge dominating factor that one species is dominating the area. So that would be a lower diversity, even though you have a ton of individuals. Now, in order to sort all this out, of course, we need another equation, and it's called the Simpson's Index of Diversity, using D as its symbol. It is a biodiversity measure that accounts for both species richness and evenness. Now, we are going to get practice doing this in another activity, so I'm not going to get into the details here. We just want to know what it is and kind of what the symbols are. Now, inside the equation, you have the kind of wonky E symbol, which is essentially the sum of the total. Sub N is the number of individuals of each different species. N prime there is the total number of individuals of all the species. So essentially what you do is you go through for each individual species and you find out how many of those individuals in each species there are, that's the sub N, and then how many of the total of all the species are there? And you plug that into the equation and calculate for that. Now what you get out of that Simpson's equation is going to be a number. It's either going to be a lower number or a higher number or somewhere in between. And a low species index suggests a few things. It suggests that there are relatively few successful species in the habitat, so there's not a lot of species that live there. The environment is usually extreme and or unstable, so only a few species have learned to deal with it. The food webs are relatively simple, and environmental change would significantly impact the biodiversity. Now, examples of this would be sandy or muddy shores, right, where there's a lot of shifting sand, there's no hard substrates, but you do have some burrowing animals like the clam and whatnot that can get down there and make a living. Now, a higher species index out of the Simpsons index is going to tell me another story. It's going to say that there is a greater number of successful species, that the environment is less hostile and more stable, more niches are available. The Food webs are going to be more complex, and the environmental change is less likely to damage the biodiversity. Now, you can see a plethora of environments there on the bottom, like everything from reefs to kelp forests to seagrass beds that are diverse, things like that. By collecting biodiversity data, we get an insight into what's going on in the community. Uh, and these trends can be used to investigate the biological health of a particular habitat. For example, if you're constantly measuring the biodiversity over a length of time and you notice that it's decreasing in a habitat, you know there's probably a reason to worry. There might be some stressor. And this eventually could lead to, for example, the coral reef on the right that's mostly all dead or the seagrass bed that's dying back. You know, So looking at these slight changes in biodiversity can be a bit of a heads up that something might be going wrong earlier than when it all crashes, that kind of a thing.
Now let's get into investigating the distribution and abundance of organisms, essentially some techniques to count things and understand where they are spatially and how many of them there are. Now scientists can use several field techniques used to collect abundance and distribution of organism data. The littoral zone specifically, or the intertidal zone along the shoreline, is a classic habitat to apply many of these techniques, and later on in the course we're going to be doing just that. Now the first method we have is quadrat sampling. This is where you use a frame quadrat, a plastic or metal square that sets a standard unit area for study of the distribution of marine organisms. And you can uh, be sized differently. You can go 10 centimeters to 100 centimeters. All of that is common. You can even make really super large ones. And they're really good and suited for estimating populations of sessile marine species, marine species that don't move around much. You can imagine trying to uh, use a quadrat to sample fish moving around. It wouldn't work very well because fish are not going to stay where they are. But if you're looking at snails, corals, seagrass coverage, any of those sorts of things where they're either pretty sessile or mostly sessile um, or don't move very fast, you can do this and use it. Now another technique you can use is a transect, which is a rope or tape marked at regular intervals that sets a standard distance for study of the distribution of marine organisms. Essentially, we're looking at a long meter tape, right? And you're measuring out distances along a particular line. Now, this can be combined with actually a quadrat where you use quadrat sampling within the transect too. Now, transect lengths or intervals are dependent on the specific area of study you're in. Rocky and sandy shores, for example, use 30 to 50 meter lines and 2 to 5 meter increments. There's something called continuous or systematic sampling. Now, continuous sampling is where samples are taken along the whole length of the transect, where systematic sampling, samplings are take, taken at fixed intervals. So like maybe every meter you do a sample, so on and so forth. So there's differences, and it all depends on the scale of the habitat you're utilizing. If you're looking at a larger area, you're going to use larger scales. If you're looking at a smaller area, smaller scales. With all of this sampling technique and data collection uh, that we're talking about, we need to talk about random sampling. Random sampling is samples that are taken at random places within a sample site. Now this is really important because as scientists we want to try and be as unbiased as possible and in order to do that we have to actually go into data collecting with methods to keep us honest and keep things random. So when we choose a study site we want to make sure that it's relatively uniform and that the habitat size is very large. Then what we do is we place our grid down and we can actually use what we call a random number generator to select certain squares within our study site randomly and then we'll go to those specific squares and actually do our data collection. That way we ensure that we are sampling randomly and we are not picking that square that happens to have that snail we're looking for just because we see it, right? So we want to make sure that we eliminate as much bias as possible and you can kind of see how random sampling works on the bottom right there. You'll see uh, a grid that has random samples, probably used a random number generator to select the sites. And then over on the right, you'll see the systemic sampling. So that means everything is very systematic. Every time you lay down a quad, these are the ones that you're going to use. So there's a various different ways you could actually do this, uh, but this is just giving you that idea. The last thing we need to talk about is ethics and ethic methods. It evaluates and chooses ways to protect the natural habitat under investigation. We're going to be out there in habitats, actively collecting data, sometimes manipulating and handling animals and or critical habitat. How do we reduce the impact in the field that we have and how do we avoid harming and damaging organisms? These are key things that have to be addressed within a particular methodology. That way it is literally implemented right as you get into the ground, right and you get in the field work, you're really making sure that you are acting in an ethical manner towards the environment. Another thing we have to do is safe methods because we need to identify potential hazards and risks involved in actually collecting data.
Obviously, if you're scuba diving in the water, you have to deal with safe diving practices and working within the nudity compression limits and making sure you're trained to do field work while you're diving, making sure all of your gear is properly accounted for, that all the safety in the boat and your dive master and everything else, all of those sorts of things. If you're working with animals, how do you protect yourself from the animal as well as the animal from harm? All of these sorts of things have to be dealt with when you're designing your methodology. All right, that is it. Remember, main idea here is that scientists measure populations and biodiversity using a variety of techniques, and each method is useful in different situations but have limitations. And of course, make sure you pay attention to all those learning goals. And until next time, keep learning.